Admit it, the universe is weird. It's cool, but weird. For instance, we now know that it's expanding, it's accelerating in its expansion due to something called dark energy, and that there's also something called dark matter holding it all together, which we know is there, but we haven't detected it directly. And then we have the dark, menacing monsters of space called black holes that may or may not swallow up information forever. But just when you think you've tallied up all the weird stuff that the cosmos has to offer, well, more turns up. Speaking of which, I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, we round up a few particularly perplexing observations and studies that reveal that the universe is indeed stranger than we can imagine. Could massive asteroid impacts be as predictable as phases of the moon? And speaking of moons, why are some of Pluto's spinning like turbine-powered pinwheels? Is there now hard evidence of parallel universes, as one scientist claims? And are there alien megastructures around a distant star? They all add up to cosmic conundra. Okay, let's begin with new research that may change our understanding of what it means to be in the right place at the wrong time. We all have a general understanding of what killed off the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. An asteroid came rocking out of the sky and crashed into Earth. This sort of unexpected bullseye you get when you hit a moving metal duck with a BB gun at the carnival. But the unlucky ducks in this case were not ducks as the ancestors of birds actually survived, but all non-avian dinosaurs and two-thirds of the planet's fauna. The rock, 10 kilometers or 6 miles across, landed near what is now the Yucatan Peninsula and generated enough debris to block the sun worldwide. Many species died of starvation. That is the asteroid theory, and the understanding has been that a mass extinction event by rock is rare, a fluke, an odd duck event. Could be... But here's the thing about our solar system. It's above all a reliable clock. We use it to mark off our days. Sun's going down, Mabel. 7.41 p.m., right on time, just like the almanac says. Is that so, Henry? And it marks off our months. And with tonight's crescent moon, we'll have a new moon in two days, right on time. That's nice, Henry. I mean, our solar system is a precision instrument. Its lunar and solar behavior, it's nothing if not predictable. So why should asteroid impacts be any different? Here comes an asteroid. This one's headed straight for the fields. 26 million years after the last one hit, right on time. Better bring in the cows, Henry. Could it be that the misfortunate phenomenon that killed off the giants of this Earth was not a one-off event, but part of a regular and predictable occurrence? This is Mike Rampino. I'm a professor at New York University of Biology and Environmental Studies. Mike Rampino and his team have found evidence that seems to support the theory that impacts occur with regularity. Yes, they seem to happen about once every 26 million years. Now, he thinks they may not be asteroids, but instead comets, that is to say big ice balls. But no matter, they're still rocks from space, and they seem to be keeping to a routine. But wait, rocks of some size rain down on the Earth all the time. There are a million shooting stars that hit the planet every day. Okay, sure, most are the size of sand grains. So how big are we talking about? We're talking about things larger than two kilometers or so, larger than a mile. So that one's a big event. But, of course, there are events of all sizes. I mean, you have little rocks that hit the Earth quite frequently, and you have big ones miles across that hit every 2 million years, 50 million years, 100 million years. It's like standing out in the rain. You get hit by drops of all sizes. The little ones are a little more common than the big ones. And maybe occasionally you get hit by a big splash. In the case of rocks from space, every 26 million years. That's like every 26 million years, somebody throwing, you know, a giant bucket of water at you. Okay, so while these big hits to the Earth are rare, it sounds like they're somewhat predictable, but what's the mechanism behind them? Well, that's the thing. It's not like comets have minds of their own. It's not like one of them says, well, it's been 26 million years since a big one of us targeted the Earth, so here I go. 
Now, something else is causing this regularity of comet impacts, and Dr. Rampino thinks that that something inhabits the outermost reaches of the solar system. Right. Well, comets live out in the Oort cloud, which is very, very far, 100,000 times the distance from the Earth to the sun. They live out there at the edges of the solar system. And it takes something to perturb them by gravitational force, actually something pushing on them that leads them to fall into the inner solar system, like shaking an apple tree and watching the apples fall. And as uh, comets fall in, a few of those comets will hit the Earth. Well, 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 what's doing this shaking? I mean, <laughs> you say every 26 million years. I'm trying to think what happens in our solar system every 26 million years. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, it turns out that the, uh, the solar system exists within what's called the Milky Way galaxy, which is a large uh, disc-shaped collection of stars. And we go around the disc once every 250 million years. And then we also bob up and down through the disc of the galaxy about once every 26 million years. And it's going through that uh, dense midplane of the galaxy where there's lots of mass, clouds and stars that can perturb our own comets and lead to them falling into the inner solar system. And that happens uh, about once every 26 million years, we pass through that danger zone. So, in other words, the solar system, of course, is rotating with the galaxy. We go around every couple of hundred million years, and you're saying as we go around, we're bobbing up and down. It sounds like a horse on a carousel ride that's also bobbing up and down as it goes around. And it, that bobbing up and down accounts for the 26 million year period. That's it. The carousel is a very good an analog for what's happening in the solar happening in the galaxy. The solar system is bobbing like a horse on a merry-go-round up and down through the central plane of the galaxy. And we pass through that plane, that central dense part, once every 26 million years or so. And it's just, what, the gravitational effect of uh, nearby stars that is causing the comets to get shook up and head for Earth? Well, some people believe it's a little more exotic than that, that there's actually dark matter in the disk of the galaxy concentrated there. And it's the gravitational effect of this invisible dark matter, which probably leads to most of the perturbation and gravitational force that affects the comet cloud. Well, can you tell me again, what is the, the best evidence for this 26 million year period? I mean, you've already noted that comets or asteroids, whatever the impactors are, that were the size of the ones that did in the dinos, so on the order of the size of, I don't know, downtown Baltimore. I mean, that those only hit once every 100 million years. How did you ever find this 26 million year period? Well, the key is looking at impact craters on the Earth, and there are a number of impact craters. There are about 185 that are known and have been, some of them have been dated very accurately. And when we looked at the record of impact craters on the Earth, from small ones to very big ones, we found uh, in our analysis uh, a periodicity, a cycle in the ages of those craters, and the cycle was 26 million years. All right, so there's just more of them every 26 million years. That's right. Now, just about everybody has heard about the big asteroid. You've mentioned it yourself that wiped out the dinos and I think something like two-thirds of all other species 66 million years ago. Uh, there have been five mass extinction events in the past 300 million years here on Earth, including the mother of all extinctions, uh, the Permian. Uh, were these also caused by impacts? Well, that's a very interesting question. And, of course, it's something that we, we're thinking about. It looks like a number of these mass extinctions correlate with times when there's a large impact crater that dates the same age as the mass extinction. So, in my view, impacts not only cause the mass extinction 66 million years ago, but it may have caused most of the mass extinctions that we've seen over the past 250 million years. But that is somewhat controversial, is it not? I mean, a lot of people recently in Europe and the U.S. have been uh, sort of pushing the idea that there was kind of a one-two punch, at least in the case of the dinosaur extinction there, the KT extinction, if you will, that uh, it wasn't just a rock from space. But there was also the result of uh, large volcanic eruptions, in this case in western India, the so-called Deccan Traps, I think. And they're saying that, you know, maybe volcanoes are just as important as rocks from the sky. Volcanoes may be important, and in fact, volcanoes and impacts may be related. It may be that an asteroid or a comet hitting the Earth causes not only local damage and, and global climatic change, but it also may, through the uh, seismic waves which go through the Earth, may disturb the Earth's mantle, and that might lead to 
uh, flood basalts, these large uh, things like the Deccan Traps, and maybe the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period, you know, 66 million years ago, was a combination of both a large asteroid and a large basaltic volcanism province. But if that's the case, then you would have to have the impact first before you had the volcanism. That's correct, but it looks as if the uh, Deccan eruption started just before the time of the impact, and it may be that they were exacerbated by the fact that the mantle of the Earth was upset and caused this very large eruption uh, of lava. I, I would think that people would point to this Permian extinction, which was a couple of hundred million years ago, and, and that was even bigger than the one that did in the dinos in terms of the number of species obliterated, and say, well, now wait a minute, Where's the crater for that? I mean, is, is there a candidate crater? Is, is there evidence that something actually hit the Earth that resulted in that extinction? Well, there is a crater that's known in, in South America that I've worked on, actually, called Araguena. And it is dated at 250 million years ago, which is exactly the same time as the mass extinction uh, at the end of the Permian, which is the biggest mass extinction on record. But I also published a paper some years ago. I suspect that there is a crater on the Falkland Plateau off of the east coast of the tip of South America that may be as large as 300 kilometers in diameter. Uh, it has not yet been uh, determined whether it is really an impact crater or not. But if it is, and it is dated from 250 million years ago, then that, that might be the smoking gun for the biggest extinction of all time, the mother of all mass extinctions. My goodness. Well, so finally then, Mike, I mean, how worried should we be? If these things really happen on a schedule of every 26 million years, that, that raises two questions for me. One, shouldn't there have been such an event since the dino extinction? It's been 66 million years since then. What's happened since? In the last 66 million years, there have been a number of impacts, none of which, though, is as large as the one that knocked out the dinosaurs. And that's a good thing, because if one had been that big, it would have knocked us out. We wouldn't be here today talking about it. All right, but then point two, if these things really are on a schedule every 26 million years, does that tell us when we have to really get serious about designing a defense? Well, we expect these comet showers once every 26 million years, and the last one was probably in the last 10 million years or so. But, you know, random impacts coming from the Oort cloud, random comets and, and random asteroids also occur. Now, even a small, you know, relatively small impact of one kilometer diameter object, uh, you know, half a mile, can cause probably enough climatic effects not to cause mass extinction, but certainly to mess with civilization. So we really have to be on the lookout for uh, all sizes of these asteroids and comets and see which ones are on a course taking them towards a collision with the Earth. Mike Rampino, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Mike Rampino is professor of biology and environmental studies at New York University. So is this question settled then? Comets or asteroids hit the Earth with regularity? Well, I, it's certainly intriguing. I have to say that in the past I've seen other claims of regularity and phenomena that went away when we got more data. That's always, you know, a possibility that Dr. Rampino is, you know, doesn't have enough data to be sure of this regularity, but he, he sounded quite convinced. So, I mean, this is certainly a reasonable hypothesis because, after all, the uh, solar system does go up and down through the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. So, you know, it's only reasonable to assume there's some effect of that. And whether it's actually shaken up the comets every 26 million years or not, well, could be, could be. Now, you and he talked about other mass extinctions over the past 250 million years. What were the key mass extinctions and, and who was extinguished? Well, of course, the big one was the Permian extinction, and that was several hundred million years ago. And that actually wiped out more species than the one that did in the dinosaurs. So that's the biggie. And up until now, you know, uh, it's been very controversial about what might have caused that. Some thought it might be a big rock. Dr. Rampino talks about the possibility of having found the crater for that. And that would be very interesting. Well, one mass extinction that is not caused by asteroids or comets is the one that we're living through now. Yes, that's a completely different mechanism indeed. It sounds as though comets and asteroids exhibit periodicity, but what about things that don't? Does the irregular blinking of a star in deep space reveal the presence of alien astroengineering? We'll find out later in the show. But first, 
why Pluto's moons seem to have gone haywire, and finally, solid evidence of a parallel universe, or so one scientist claims. I hope that in that other universe I have a larger model railroad layout and more power tools. Dream big, Seth. It's Cosmic Conundrum on Big Picture Science. It sounds as if asteroid and comet impacts aren't totally random, but wax and wane just like the moon, albeit over a much longer time frame. But these aren't the only space rocks whose behavior is surprising. A recap. Shh, everybody, it's time for my favorite soap, the edge of the solar system. When we last heard from the New Horizons spaceship, it had a dramatic encounter with Pluto, whose true identity was a mystery. Ashley, you must face the difficult truth. My brother, Luke, the astronomer who recovered from amnesia after being hit by a truck stolen by his ex-wife on her way to meet the daughter that she didn't know she had, says Pluto is a dwarf planet. It can't even clear objects from its orbital path. I don't believe that, Tyler. And neither does my twin brother, Jordan, the planetary scientist who we thought had died in a laboratory fire but who was actually hiding in a cabin living on funds he had embezzled from a charity. He says Pluto is a planet. As they debated Pluto's identity, the New Horizons spacecraft had already moved on and was 100 million miles deeper into the Kuiper Belt. But it left scientists struggling to come to terms with shocking truths about Pluto. That it had mountains made of ice. That it was younger than thought, its surface devoid of craters. But are scientists prepared for what comes next on the edge of the solar system? The New Horizons flyby certainly has been dramatic. Pluto may be in the rearview mirror of the spacecraft, but data streaming back to Earth continue to surprise scientists. The latest eyebrow raiser, the weird behavior of Plutonian moons. Four of them, Nix, Hydra, Kerberos, and Styx, orbit what can be described as a binary planet, consisting of Pluto and its largest moon, Charon. Planetary scientist Mark Showalter, who discovered two of Pluto's moons, says that he and other scientists can only speculate that it's this binary arrangement that has influenced the strange movement of the smaller four satellites. And strange it is. They're spinning very, very fast. Uh, I guess that would be the best way to put it. The Hydra is the little speed demon. It's the outermost of these tiny moons, but it rotates 89 times every time it rotates around Pluto. Okay, now are all the moons, I mean, what are there, five moons of Pluto that we know about? Well, yes, so there are five moons. The largest one, Charon, has been known about for a long time, and Charon is in very close. It's about half as big as Pluto, and those two are called tidally locked, like the Earth and the moon. They keep one face toward each other. And the other four moons are much smaller, and they orbit these two objects as sort of a dumbbell, a rotating dumbbell in the middle. So the four small moons are the ones that are little speed demons. Not only are they rotating very fast, but they're rotating at crazy angles. For example, Nix is tilted 45 degrees and rotating backwards in a period of about one and a half days, even though it takes uh, about 25 days to go around Pluto. You, you, you found a couple of these moons yourself, right? Yeah, Styx and Kerberos. I led the led that uh, those research projects with the Hubble telescope, Kerberos, in uh, 2011 and Styx in 2012. All right. Now, it sounds like these outer moons, which are mostly small, but entirely small, I suppose, they're, they're behaving like wild children. Why is it that it took the New Horizons spacecraft to learn that? I mean, you had found these things, or the two moons you found. You found them with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, why couldn't we have known they were spinning like crazy? Well, because they're not that easy to see from Earth. Uh, just as one example, Styx, which is the smallest moon, it is 100,000th as bright as Pluto, and its distance off of Pluto is one arc second, which is kind of like the the, the width of a hair at 30 feet or something like that. So, uh, so you're essentially, you know, we don't think of Pluto as a bright object in the sky, obviously, but 
for Hubble, it is. And we're, you're staring into a headlight and looking for a uh, flea that's, uh, that's uh, sitting on the headlight. That's the kind of observation we're taking. So finding these objects at all in the Hubble telescope was difficult. To figure out how they rotate, you have to look for the way they're changing in their brightness. For example, all these objects are elongated, so depending on the orientation to the viewer, they might be brighter or dimmer at different times. And so you have to be able to measure those changes in brightness in order to get the rotation rates out. Turns out now that we have data from the, the New Horizons, which actually shows this information very clearly, I've been able to go back to the Hubble data and actually find these rotation rates. But the fact is, I didn't even think of looking for such fast rotation at the time because moons don't do that, or at least they aren't supposed to do that. And Pluto has surprised us once again. Well, I can imagine that you were probably quite surprised to, find, to, to discover these fast spinning moons. Uh, but the obvious question is, why are they doing that? I mean, why are Pluto's outer moons not in synchronous rotation? You know, what's the cause of this? Yeah, well, we're asking ourselves that very question, as you might guess. You know, one of my great pleasures as, a, as an astronomer is when I can show uh, results to my colleagues and then say, are you sure that's right? That's crazy. So uh, this is definitely one of those cases. But one of the things that we did figure out about the moons of Pluto just a few months ago is that they are if they were to slow down to the point where they would be close to synchronous rotation, where they have one face toward each other, the fact that you're orbiting this dumbbell of two objects, Pluto and Charon, instead of one object, uh, would keep them wobbling, and we would expect to see wobbles in their orbits. In fact, chaotic behavior, which is sort of unpredictable behavior. So we were expecting we were expecting wobbles, but we were not expecting things like this. And so now we have to go back to the drawing board and figure out, is there something about how Pluto and Charon interact with these moons that does that? Because let's, let's point out the sort of obvious. We've got four small moons in the solar system that rotate ridiculously fast, and they are also the four small objects that orbit the only binary planet in the solar system. Pluto and Charon are so close in size and so similar that they act as a basically two objects instead of one, and uh, the four objects are orbiting this binary. That can't be a coincidence. It must be that there's some role that the binary plays in making these moons spin in crazy ways. I can imagine that dynamicists, as they're occasionally called, the people who worry about this with pencil and paper are busy uh, trying to figure out what's going on. Well, let's say they don't use pencil and paper so much anymore as they use uh, computers to, to do these, these ridiculous, complicated calculations. But there's some discussion about whether uh, maybe the Pluto is such a weak such a weak gravity field around Pluto that Hydra couldn't spin down, that Hydra is basically spinning at the speed it always spun at, and that tides don't work very well. But other people do that calculation and don't agree. So uh, it may have to do with the fact that Pluto has a weak gravity field, and that's part of the story as well. But that's debatable, and people are debating it. Which, well, which delights me as someone who was involved in figuring this all out. And, and finally, Mark, it remains at the moment it's still a puzzle, but of course that's what you always really hope to find in science and astronomy especially. I mean, as Isaac Asimov once said, the most important words spoken during an experiment are, are that's funny, you know, that kind of thing. You don't, exactly send a, right. you don't send a spacecraft billions of miles from Earth merely to confirm something you already expect to find, right? So in a sense, this is great news in a way. Oh, yeah, this is the fun stuff. Um, and, and I should also add, I, I do these studies of the dynamics of the small moons. Everybody who has any involvement in the New Horizons project has been just blown away. Pluto has surprised us in just so many different ways, and Charon has surprised us. There are big snow fields. There are possibly volcanoes. There are big ice mountains. Everybody who studies any aspect of the Pluto system is just having the time of their lives right now. Mark Showalter, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Seth. Mark Showalter is a senior research scientist at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. Well, these moves are really spinning fast. It's a whole new phenomenon in a way. That's what's interesting about it. As Mark said, this is when the fun begins. And maybe this has uh, application to double stars in the galaxy. There may be planets out there that are spinning very fast because of whatever mechanism it is that's causing these moons to spin. So the puzzle is to try to figure out what that mechanism is that's causing these moons to spin like crazed pinwheels. Exactly. And you can be sure it's, you know, going to be Newtonian gravity. But figuring it out in detail, yeah, it's still a puzzle. Okay, there's cosmic weirdness and there's cosmic weirdness. And what could be more out of this world than being 
out of this universe. I mean, that's right. It doesn't get much stranger than the thought of parallel universes. Universes parallel of idea the than stranger much get, doesn't it? Wait, did uh, we cut funding for the echo effect? That wasn't very accurate. I'm not an echo. You are an echo. I am you in a parallel universe, Seth. Everything is the same except presented backwards. I mean, backwards presented except same. The is everything. Really? <laughs> and I'm more retrograde than usual. Why is that? Because with infinite universes, multiverse or parallel, whatever you call them, you can have infinite variations on reality. Theory in. So my life and this radio show are unfolding out there in all sorts of permutations? Yep. There's one where the radio show takes place in 16 dimensions, one in which everything is spoken in haiku, one with Isaac Newton and a chihuahua hosting, one in which Molly makes the jokes. I can't imagine that one has an audience. One in which it does have an audience. Anything you can imagine. Imagine, can you anything? Go gotta. Imaginative theories about parallel universes abound, but the idea that they exist in any form is mind-bending. I mean, the universe is all that there is, right? Everything that was produced after the Big Bang is the universe, so how could you have more than one? Well, the answer might be found in the afterglow of the Big Bang, the sky-spanning glow known as the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, or CMB. Scientists study this thermal radiation because it's the farthest back in time we can use light to explore our origins, our beginnings. Imprinted on the glowing photons of the CMB are the beginnings of what became the galaxies of our universe. But some think that the CMB also contains evidence of other universes. It's a canvas which is very uniform across the sky. So this allows us to search for bumps with other universes which may have radically different physical properties than our own. A bump would be where a patch of those energetic CMB photons had collided with photons from another universe's CMB. So that patch would be a little brighter. And Ranga Ram Chari, an astronomer at the California Institute of Technology, says that using a European Space Agency telescope named Planck, his team has found some bumps. By examining the CMB at multiple frequencies, they found regions where a patch of photons is a little hotter than usual. And we see that at one frequency, the cold spots are not as cold as they are at other frequencies. That indicates that there has to be some process of energy injected in at that frequency. And we looked for possibilities from the galactic interstellar medium and we looked for possibility of emission from other galaxies, and neither of those could explain that. That is what led us to believe that this excess emission might be due to protons and electrons combining with each other about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, but there's a lot more protons in a patch of sky than we expect from our universe. Well, well wait a minute. You're, you're telling me that there were some particles that were causing this, some injection, if you will, of energy from somewhere outside the universe. That's right. The particles were injected into our universe from an alternate universe. If we're really seeing bruises, if you will, to the young universe, I, I, I realize that might be a bad metaphor, but doesn't that mean that there were other kids in the litter? Doesn't that mean that there are universes coming into being essentially all the time if we had the bad luck to, to bump up against one? Absolutely. The probability of collision within another universe is so small that if we find one or two collisions in different patches of the sky, then it absolutely means that there are a multitude of other universes. Let me get this idea of the multiple universe in, in a clear perspective. How do I imagine that? Is it just some sort of, I don't know, meta-universe, some infinite and immortal space? I hate to use the word space, but some sort of place in which big bangs occasionally go off making new universes all the time and endlessly. I think the best analogy is bubbles in a soda bottle. So you open a soda bottle and what happens? The dissolved gas starts to form bubbles and expands out of the fluid. Now each one of these bubbles is a universe and occasionally these bubbles collide with each other and you can imagine that when our universe collides with another universe it's like two bubbles sticking together. 
All right, but uh, that means, in this case, the meta-universe is the soda. <laughs> is there really soda in this meta-universe, in this space in which these bubbles are being formed? I mean, is there something in there? There has to be, and that is space. So the implication is that we are looking at a very tiny part of space. Is this just a matter of more could be better, kind of like my attitude toward desserts? I mean, what's the payoff from science's point of view to, to having multiple universes? What's, what's the advantage? Well, I think a good analogy for that is the 7 billion people on the planet. Each one of the 7 billion people have a unique characteristic, which is somewhat irreproducible in another person. Our universe just happens to be like one individual, so there could be 7 billion other universes out there. It just so happens that it has the unique characteristics that allow stars, galaxies, and clusters of galaxies to form. It could be that the other 6.99 billion universes never had the conditions which allowed stars and galaxies and life to form. All right, so the benefit here is that we wouldn't need to scratch our heads about the fact that our universe seems so well suited for our existence then. We just kind of won the lottery. Yes, we do not understand why the properties of our universe are the way they are. Why is the vacuum energy density the value it is? Why is the baryon to photon ratio the value where it is? It could be that it's just a random number and these other universes have completely different numbers. So it's just that we are a chance fluctuation. Well, let's say this holds up, Rangaram. What are the consequences? Could we ever see into one of these other universes? Could we ever learn anything really about them? You know, whether that universe that bumped into ours has, you know, the usual three space dimensions in time or whether it has two or five or 15 or, I mean, will we learn anything about it? Absolutely. We have measured the increase in brightness at one frequency. However, the signal probably spans a range of frequencies, just very closely spaced. So if we sample those frequencies very finely, we will understand what the properties of the fine structure constant are in that other universe. We will also know what the rate of expansion of the universe is. So we can learn more about the other universe if we can improve the statistical significance of the signal. Well, finally, Rangaram, if there is a multiverse, don't you imagine that eventually someone's going to say, hey, uh, that's not enough. There are multiple multiverses. I mean, how far up can this go? Yes, that's an excellent point. The method of science is to ask difficult questions and to try to answer them. So if we can confirm the presence of an alternate universe, I'd say we'd be making progress. It would be a lot like what we thought the Earth looked like in 300 BC when all we knew about was Europe and the northern tip of Africa. So we've made a lot of progress with time. So I think at least in the next five to 10 years, it would be nice to assess whether or not there are other universes. And once we answer that question, we can start thinking about whether there are multiple multiverses. Ranga Ramchari, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Thank you very much for your interest. Ranga Ramchari is an astronomer with the U.S. Planck Data Center at the California Institute of Technology. So what they found here are hotspots in the CMB and the interpretation is this could be evidence of other universes. What an incredible find. Well, earlier in the show, we played around with the idea that there could be infinite versions of this radio show taking place in, in infinite universes. Is that how scientists see it, that if you have parallel universes, the events that unfolded in this universe are unfolding in other universes with a slight difference? Well, only if there's an infinite number of them. If, if the number of other universes is somehow finite, if at any given time there are only, you know, a million of them or a billion or trillion, then you're not going to find, you know, sort of uh, alien versions of this show in, in those universes. If there's an infinite number, then anything that happens in any one of them will happen with every possible variation in an infinite number of them. And that just is going to cause your head to hurt. It is hurting a little bit. Okay, so let's say there's an, a finite number of universes, but more than one. What's happening in those other universes? Hard to say. The point is you don't even know what the physics is in those universes. I mean, we have three dimensions of space and one of time and all that sort of stuff. But these other universes could be, you know, just randomly put together with two dimensions or 12 dimensions or four dimensions. You know, maybe stars don't form in most of them. The whole point is that if you have lots and lots of them, most of them are really weird and unsuitable for anything that we would find familiar. 
But if you have a very large number of them, then a few of them will be pretty good, and we happen to be in one of the good ones, because otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. And what we heard in that interview is they may have found evidence of parallel universes. At least one other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, it's intriguing to imagine life in parallel universes, but so is imagining life elsewhere in our own. Is the weird behavior of the light coming from a distant star being caused by an alien megastructure? We discuss next. It's one of many cosmic conundra on Big Picture Science. Well, in our final consideration of some recent cosmic conundra, we turn to the weird behavior of a star that's far, far away. It all started in September 2015, when astronomers working on data from NASA's Kepler Space Telescope reported on a puzzling fact. The light from this star, and its pleasing name is KIC 8462852, occasionally dims. In fact, it dims by a lot, and not regularly, as would be the case if there were a planet in orbit around it. Something else is causing this star to wink every now and then. But what could be the something else? The astronomers, led by a postdoc at Yale University, considered a list of possibilities. Dust in space, sunspots on the star, even debris from comets. But talk turned to another, more dramatic possibility alien hardware, some sort of megastructure built by an advanced society. The idea was when this construction occasionally got in the way of the star, it would cause the starlight to dim. And that would be spectacular news because it would tell us someone's out there. Now, everyone is trying not to jump to sensational conclusions because there have been other discoveries by astronomers in the past that were also puzzling and for which one explanation would have been the work of aliens but they all turned out to be caused by natural phenomena. And to find out more about this story, we turn to a guest, and I welcome him to the show. It's, it's great to have you with us here on Big Picture Science. Well, I've got to say I've always been a fan of the show, and it's, and it's a pleasure to be here. Okay, Seth, you know something about this story. I do. Okay. This star in question, with the lovely name of KIC 8462852, what is it doing that has everyone all shook up? Well... As we said, it's dimming occasionally. And when I say occasionally, you know, it's every couple of hundred days or something like that. That dimming was actually found by a, what's called a citizen science project. They put the data that had been collected by NASA's Kepler Space Telescope on this star. They put that data on the Internet so people could uh, analyze it in the privacy of their own home. And they found that occasionally it would dim, not by a little. In some cases, the light would dim by more than 20%. That's comparable to dimming your headlights on the highway. Well, it's exhibiting some strange behavior, and that behavior is it's blinking. Yes. Okay. So what's so special about that? Because stars blink and yeah. twinkle all the time, don't well, they? Well, <laughs> well, they certainly twinkle if you go outside at night and watch them, but that's because of our atmosphere. Actually, the, the output from most stars is pretty, pretty constant. I mean, if you were to stare at the sun for, uh, you know, days on end. I, I wouldn't recommend that. But if you did that, you'd find that, you know, the sun's brightness is pretty much unchanged. You know, a tiny fraction of a percent, maybe a little bit, when you get sunspots, for example, that go across it. Or if there were a transit of Venus, for example, and that happens every now and again, Venus gets between you and the sun. So Venus blocks about one part in a thousand of the light from the sun. That's not very much. Even Jupiter would only block 1%. But it's the blocking of the light that causes the blinking. The twinkling is the effect that's produced when we look at stars through our atmosphere. But the blinking is caused when an object gets between the viewer and the star itself. Exactly. It's just like a moth flying in front of a, I don't know, a street lamp a block away. If you look carefully, you might notice that the street lamp got a little bit dimmer. Okay, but out there in deep space, we don't think there are any moths, right? Well, I mean, there's no. I think Mothra is confined to the environs of Tokyo. Okay, but there are planets, so how do we know this isn't a planet getting in front of this star and causing it to blink? Yeah, well, that would be the first thought. But the thing about a planet is, A, it wouldn't dim it nearly as much as what we're seeing here. I mean, 20% dimming? 
you know, as I say, Pluto would dim at 1%, and Pluto's a pretty big planet. So it just doesn't seem reasonable from that point of view. But the second thing is you would expect it to blink once and then blink again when the planet got in front of it again and then blink a third time and then a fourth and a fifth and endlessly. And none of that was seen. So the chances that it's a planet aren't very high. Well, there are other theories. There's dust in space and sunspots on the star and so forth. But let's jump to the one that has everyone all excited, um, which is the possibility of an alien megastructure. First of all, what is an alien megastructure? And is it much larger than an alien structure? <laughs> one presumes. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's it become a kind of a word you hear a lot at parties. Mega no, 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 it's not. Oh, well, you need to go to better parties. But it, look, megastructure just means that, look, the universe is three times as old as, you know, our solar system. So most of the stars out there are a lot older than our own planet and sun and the other planets of our solar system. So there's been plenty of time. There's been billions of additional years for some aliens to advance, to become far more technically sophisticated than we are. So you can imagine that if some society, which is a thousand, a million years more advanced than we are, you know, they, they want to improve their lifestyle by building something really big, that maybe they've done it. And what we found here is evidence that somebody's done something like that. And we should really get excited because, after all, if there are advanced beings around this star, well, I mean, that would be big news. Coming back to the megastructure, so are we talking a ship? Well, is that what you mean? Well, that would be a pretty big rocket ship. I mean, even the Starship Enterprise isn't nearly big enough to block 20% of the light from a star. Okay, but it's moving in space, right? Yeah, it's moving in space, but it has to be big. It has to be, you know, it has to block 20% of the light of the star, which means it has to be at least 20% of the, you know, the area, if you will, of the disk of that star. Uh, there's nothing that we built that would be anything like that. But one possibility, and this has been suggested, is that it's a Dyson Swarm. Now, you know, some listeners will have heard of Dyson spheres. This is an idea of the physicist Freeman Dyson from, a, I don't know, about half a century ago. And he said, look, if you really want to solve the energy problem on your planet, what you do is you don't dig up stuff to burn. What you do is you construct solar panels, satellites, solar panel satellites. You put them in space. You surround your sun. I mean, we could do that. We could take apart Neptune and build all these solar panels around, you know, the orbit of the Earth and just collect all that energy and beam it down to Earth without you know, burning anything or causing any environmental degradation here. And maybe that's what it is. It's just a whole bunch of solar panel satellites that occasionally get in front of the star and are blocking the light. I want to come back to what's holding this alien mega structure up, if it does exist. Is it in orbit around the star? Right. Exactly right. Exactly right. They just put it in orbit. I mean, it's like asking what holds the space station up. It's just in orbit. So these things would be in orbit, but they'd be in orbit around the star, not necessarily around your planet. Okay. So the blinking would be caused by every time this alien superstructure, megastructure, went in between us, or the Kepler Space Telescope in this case, and its parent star. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You're just, all you're doing is seeing, a, if you will, a little eclipse by some of their technology. Really an appealing idea. It tells you not only that somebody's there, but it also tells you that, well, they're more advanced than we are, Bob. Do you think there are aliens on board? I mean, if there's an alien megastructure, are there aliens on board? Well, I, I, that's a second level of speculation. And I can't say too much about that, but I suppose there are maintenance personnel you'd need. I, I don't know. All right. So this is a very intriguing idea, and I know that it's gotten a lot of people excited. Uh, what is the evidence for it, Seth? I mean, how do you go about collecting evidence for a theory like this? Well, that's really the point, isn't it? Because it's easy to come up with the idea. The idea was broached almost from the beginning, although the people who found the dimming did not suggest this. They suggested all sorts of natural explanations. They didn't immediately jump to the alien explanation. But to prove it, well, we here at the SETI Institute, the SETI team here, immediately took the uh, Allen Telescope Array our 42 antennas up in the uh, Cascade Mountains of California here. Which is a radio telescope array. It is. It's a bunch of antennas with sensitive receivers. And we pointed them in the direction of uh, KIC A462852, uh, trying to see if we got any radio signals coming from it. Because obviously if we did, we would say, well, wait a minute. I mean, yeah, okay, it dims. But now we've picked up, you know, radio signals. So there really is somebody there. Well, we didn't find any. We didn't find any. We've also looked for flashing lights coming from... Uh, that star system, you know, due to a laser or something like that. We haven't found that either. Mind you, it doesn't completely rule out the possibility that there's some advanced aliens there because this star is so far away, it's almost 1,500 light years, that's pretty far, that it would be very 
difficult to pick up radio signals or light signals from there unless they had, you know, the mother of all transmitters. Those radio waves would have attenuated? Yeah, it's just the distance. They would would have gotten so weak that you, you can work backwards and, and figure out how strong would their transmitter have to be for us to have picked it up. You, you're you talking about a humongous transmitter. So, you know, it may be they don't have a humongous transmitter and they're still there. You can't rule that out. But we found no additional evidence that there's actually, a, you know, advanced uh, alien society there. So what's the next step? Well, other people using other telescopes, of course, are investigating this star system. One thing they've been looking for and haven't found so far is uh, infrared radiation. Some of the telescopes, in particular the WISE telescope and the Spitzer telescope, we talk about those instruments here at Big Picture Science quite frequently. They're looking for a little bit of infrared. You may say, well, so what? Why? I mean, what does that do? Infrared is an indicator of heat. So if they have a megastructure there, you can be sure this megastructure is a little bit warm because it's, after all, sitting in the sunlight there of KIC 846-2852, and you might be able to pick up that warmth. That might be hard. But if it's not that, if it's just a bunch of dust, which is another possibility for blocking the light, that would be warm and you'd pick that up. But so far, nobody's found any infrared. So the best guess today, where the smart money is, is that what's going on at KIC 846-2852 is that there's a bunch of you know, broken up comets there, and they're the cause of this blocking of the light. And then those other possibilities that we mentioned earlier, the dust in space, sunspots on the star, um, those are natural explanations, and have they been ruled out, or are they still in the running? Well, I think everything's still in the running. I think the lead horse is uh, the broken up comets. That's what uh, people seem to think is most likely going on. Well, Seth, are astronomers and SETI astronomers in new territory here when they investigate the possible evidence of alien life in this form, for example, the, an actual structure? Well, I think the specifics are, are, are new, but, you know, we've been down a similar road before because, well, the most uh, well-known example is in the 1960s, the first discovery of pulsars. Pulsars, all we knew was that if you pointed your antenna in a certain direction on the sky, you would hear this signal that was very regular, psh, 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 just about every second, right? This was done at Cambridge University in the uh, UK. And the, the, the astronomers there for a while called them LGMs, little green men. They didn't know what it was. And they thought, this is so regular. This can't be nature. It's got to be, you know, Klingons. It's got to be something. Well, it turned out it, it wasn't Klingons. It was dead stars that are producing these things. And they're, they're known as pulsars. That's one example. That's their dying call in some way? Of, of the stars, yes, yeah. <laughs> not the Klingons. So, so you know, that was a bit of a warning. Hey, look, you know, every time you discover something new, there's always going to be a small number of people who say, you know what, this is due to aliens. But in fact, you know, there have been several examples of things we didn't understand at first, and some people thought it might be alien activity, but it never has been. It's always been nature, nature. So I think that's uh, likely to be the explanation here, too. Well, Seth, if news develops on this story of uh, KIC 846-2852, will you share it with us? <laughs> yes, I will. First? Act, well, <laughs> well, you may hear about it first only because you're here at the office, and you, may, and you may learn about it first. But, of course, it would be extraordinarily big news. Well, we've talked about very strange phenomena in our show, and everything we've talked about in this show goes to prove that the universe is still strange and can surprise us. Yes, and, and that in itself is surprising because if you grabbed a bunch of astronomers in 1900, for example, and said, you know, what are the big puzzles of the universe? They would have said there aren't too many more. They've, they've figured out all the major stuff. They still didn't know what made the stars shine and how elements were produced. There were still puzzles, but they were on their way to, to solving those. Well, it turned out that in the next 100 years, they came up with dark energy, dark matter. I mean, there were more puzzles than anybody would have predicted. And, and frankly, that may remain the case, that we continue to find that the universe is stranger than we thought it could be. So we've looked at the perhaps regular behavior of comets and the irregular behavior of Pluto's moons, uh, the possible evidence for parallel universes, a tantalizing suggestion of an alien habitat. Again, there's no evidence for that conclusively. Well, those are all very intriguing in the next round of stories, puzzling stories from the universe, what do you think that frontier will be? Well, that's the question I can't answer, obviously, because when you discover something new, by definition, you didn't expect to find it. And actually, as Mark Showalter said, that's the interesting thing about astronomy. It's exploration. 
It's like getting in a ship and sailing off to seas that have never been sailed before. Well, that is the end of this show. Thanks to the Cosmic Wonders who helped produce it, Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. Also, thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky david and Sammy David. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to Cosmic Conundrum. And if you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, you'll find it in our archive on our website, bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener, but you prefer listening to over-the-air radio because you find it a conundrum how you could possibly listen to a show on the Internet, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. Oh, and uh, do you have a comment, a criticism, or a suggestion? Throw in some faint praise? Email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. Welcome to Big Picture Science. I'm Sir Isaac, here with my diminutive canine co-host. And on this episode, as in every episode, objects in motion. (laughs) 